uh, we're aware that that certain times in the last year, year and a half, you've experienced some long hold times when you've tried to get a hold of us. Uh, there's been instances in, in big time outage situations where you haven't been able to get through at all. We're aware of that, we're working on that. Uh, Sue mentioned we receive in the neighborhood of 7,000 calls every month. Uh, that's a massive number. And one of our major focuses in 2013 and, and mine personally is, is how we can better structure that, that area to better serve you, better get to your calls, better answer your questions without having to necessarily add employees and thus add costs. So that that's just one one example of many of, of the balancing act that we're doing internally to balance the service we can provide with the affordability of your electric rates. And for us, affordability starts with our loan covenants. Uh, just like your, your mortgage or your car loan, uh, we have requirements that are set by our, our financial institutions. And for us, our primary lender is the, the federal government's rural utility service. Uh, if you've been around a while and looking around the room, some of you have, uh, you, you might remember it as the REA. That's now called the RUS. Uh, even though we are structured as a not-for-profit electric cooperative, uh, we are required by the RUS to, to maintain a margin. And that is so that we can, we can continue to ensure that we can operate and maintain a safe and reliable electric distribution on behalf of all of our members. And for us, that means controlling costs across one of the largest geographic service territories for utilities in the United States. As part of, part of my report, I brought along our 2012 audit report uh, from Brady Martz and Associates. They're an, an independent audit firm that we hire to do our audit every year. We are required to do that. Uh, I, if, I, you can look at them if you want. Uh, if you need some light bedtime reading, you can catch up with me afterwards and I can get you a copy. Uh, if you're an insomniac, it would, it would put you right down. It's perfect. <laughs> But yeah, if, if, catch me later if you want to look at one here. If you need one, let me know. I'll get, you, get one sent out to your email so you have an electronic version as well. <laughs> this is the third year that we had Brady Martz do our, our audit. They're a, they're a CPA firm based out of Grand Forks, North Dakota. They do audits for over 20 electric cooperatives, and that includes two generation and transmission cooperatives. Uh, we're a distribution cooperative. So Great River Energy is our generation and transmission cooperative. So they're highly qualified to do audits in our industry. Uh, the audit was conducted, and this is some CPA speak. I'm a recovering CPA myself. Uh, the audit was conducted using generally accepted auditing standards, and I'm pleased to report that they dish, did issue a clean opinion uh, on our accounting, our accounting controls and our accounting records. Uh, it also indicated, they indicated in their report that we are in compliance with all of our, our financial obligations that are set by the Real Utility Service and, and our other lenders. In their report to the board, they, they noted verbally that our rates are mirroring increased cost of wholesale power. And while that's the case, our, our operating margin, or essentially our operating income, has not kept pace with that. We've kept that flat. And that's largely due to what I'll get into in a little bit. I got a nice picture for you. Due to f declining and flat kilowatt hour sales under our old rate structure, where a large portion of our costs were recovered through the energy rate and not necessarily the fixed charge. Now, other numbers that we continue to watch are our utility plant investments. For us, that's things like poles, wires, trucks, transformers, substations, those things. Those numbers continue to grow. Our distribution system continues to grow, and, and that is to, to meet your reliability needs and your expectations of reliability. As those investments grow, so do the costs of depreciation and interest for us. And for us, the annual number for 2013 is going to be in excess of $13 million in depreciation and interest costs related to our or utility investments. We do have monthly financials that are posted on our website and they're also printed in our monthly newsline newsletter that we mail out. Our year-end financials for 2012 were included in the annual report that we mailed out earlier this month. So if you get a chance, look at that. If you, if you want some more detail, I've got an audit report you can, I can send to you. I want to take a few minutes and explain some of the, some of the challenges we're currently facing with, with the numbers. This graph here is, is a graph of our essentially our cost structure. The, the red portion on the bottom, that's, that's the cost of wholesale power. Uh, that's about 55% of our total expenses. We do not generate the power. We own the substations and the distribution network up to and including your meter. Great River Energy owns the generation and the transmission assets to get that to our substations. 
You can see our costs are largely driven by increases in wholesale power, and, and is in no way is that meant to be any kind of a, a dig at Great River Energy. They're, they're not alone in this situation. A lot of it's coming from environmental regulations, renewables mandates, and John Brecky from GRE is here, and he's, he's going to speak after me and explain some of that stuff to you. The blue portion on the top, that's our what we consider our local cost. It's the other 45% of our budget. The largest of that is the depreciation and interest that I was explaining a little bit ago. I really like this one, even though it's going to be impossible for most of you to see. Now what it what it does is it, the years go from 2002 out through 2012, so it's a 10-year view. And what it what it is, it, it assumes 2002 on the left-hand side is 100%. So if we, I got a little fancy laser pointer here too. This green line on the bottom, that's the number of new services that we connect every year. Uh, the number way out on the end is 31. That, what that means is in 2012, we connected 31% of the new services that we had connected 10 years before in 2002. That's an indicator of system growth. We've not seen system growth. We've had really declines in growth and sales. The blue line across the middle, that's our total kilowatt hour sales. And you can see from that, that's pretty flat. The number out on the end is 108% of what it was 10 years ago. That's another indicator of growth. We've not seen a growth in numbers. We've also not seen significant growth in sales. And the red line on the top, the red line is the cost of wholesale power per kilowatt hour sold. So out there, that's 168. So that's 168 percent of what it was 10 years ago. What this situation creates is rate pressure. When we don't have growth in, in consumer numbers and growth in sales, and we're in a period of increasing costs, our current members have to, are feeling that in the form of rates because we have nowhere else to collect that from. Hopefully things will things will bounce back and we'll see some see some recovery in this area. But I'm not I'm not seeing that myself or any economists I talk to. They're not expecting that in the near future. This one this is a graph of our our total sales from the formation of Lake Country Power in 1997. As you can see, we had a lengthy period of of significant and pretty steady growth on the system up until. The peak there is in 2007. After that, what hit us is what they're referring to now as the Great Recession. So we, we saw a period of several years of declining sales, and now it's kind of flattened out. Uh, however, the, the miserable winter we're just coming out of was favorable for energy sales. So I didn't necessarily like it, but when I was in the office, I did, it, it didn't bother me too much. But, <laughs> but the, you know, the projections I've seen are that that's going to remain pretty flat. We're not expecting a major major bounce back in, in any kind of the local economy, I'd, I'd put it, or even state or national. And we were asked by a, by a member who lives in Wisconsin to, uh, to take a look at our rate structure and do an analysis if the facility charge was set at $10. So this is what that looks like. Uh, you can see that you know anybody using 600 kilowatt hours or more comes out on the short end of this deal. Uh, if we did that, if it was at $10, the energy rate or the kilowatt hour rate would have to be 5.72 cents higher per kilowatt hour than it is right now. So if you know, somebody out on the end there, that's that's 5,000 kilowatt hour user. That could be a you know, small business or something. The annual impact is over $3,000 for somebody at that level of usage. So, you know, it's important to note that because, you know, our distribution system, it doesn't care how much energy flows through it. Uh, in this scenario, Small users would be subsidized up to 76% by other members. And what another way to word that is what that means is that you know, our, our small users would have access to the same distribution system as all of our other members at a fraction of the cost of the system itself. So you could ask yourself, you know, is, how fair is that? And, and that's the main reason for, for the rate change we implemented last September was, was that fairness issue. And you remember, with, the facility charge went from $22.50 up to $42. However, the, the energy rate or the kilowatt hour rate went down over two cents a kilowatt hour. Co-ops op operate on the philosophy that, that members share, all members share in the costs and the benefits. I mean, that's, that's the foundation of, of co-ops and our present rate structure was designed with that in mind. Derek threw out the number. We, our distribution system spans more than 8,200 miles of line. Uh, the cost of the lines of substations, all the equipment is shared by all the consumers, and it, it's spread across generations. And the reason for that being is, you know, a pole that we put in 20 years ago is still benefiting our members today, and poles and wires that we string up today are going to benefit members 20, 30, 40, 
some cases even 50 years from now. And if we didn't spread that cost amongst members and across generations, the cost to serve would be even higher than it is today. That's the co-op business model. It's, it's how we were formed by the REA. It's because the, areas, because the areas we serve are not profitable. It's why other, other utilities have chosen not to serve these areas. It's why we exist. We have over $275 million in assets across the service territory that's larger than the states of Connecticut, Delaware, and Rhode Island combined. You all own a share of those assets. And every year when financial conditions allow a portion of your investment in the co-op is returned to you in the form of capital credits. Uh, this number on here, this 29.4 million, we've returned over $29.4 million in capital credits. And that goes back to the formations of, of the three predecessor co-ops, Northern Electric, Darren Land Electric, and Carleton County Electric, including Lake Country Power. So from the formation of, of any utility that serves this area. When we retire capital credits, it's, it's one way that members benefit. You know, I spent some time talking about costs, but that's the other side of the, the co-op business models that members share in the costs as well as the benefits. Capital credits are a benefit. Uh, your single, single biggest benefit you receive from us, though, is your electric service. Uh, it's when you're without that or we're without that that we realize the value of that the most. Uh, we work every day, Derek and his group, the engineering group, we've got several operations folks in here who work every day to try to minimize the chances for outages as well as the duration of those outages. Still, though, given, given the area of God's country we choose to live in, when the wind blows, trees hit the lines and outages are going to happen. You know, our, we can do all the right-of-way work we want. Trees, some trees are, are taller than our easements are wide. So that's what happens. That's the major cause of our outages is tree-related incidents. We had, uh, here. we had several major weather events in 2012 I want to touch on. We had... Uh, in April of 2012, and this is a year ago, we had a major snow and ice storm come through this region here. We had several thousand members out of power for an extended period of time. Uh, and then in June, uh, it's, it's coming up on the news again now, there was historic flooding in the, in the southern parts of our territory. And we served the city of Moose Lake, and I don't know what, half or better than half of the city was underwater. Big Sandy Lake north of McGregor, we had members without power there for months. What happened was the water came up and essentially put their distribution system and their wiring underwater. So we couldn't energize those services until they got rewired and reinspected. So that was a major outage situation for us there. And I believe the, the entire county of Aiken County for a while was under a no wake zone. That's how high the water was in Aiken County. I don't know if that makes any sense to me, but it, apparently you couldn't have a wake anywhere in the county. <laughs> and then July 2nd, I think like that one too. And, July 2nd, we had major straight line winds go, te go tearing through the Grand Rapids area. And we, before we could even get that cleaned up, July 4th, the same thing happened over in this neck of the woods here. And we had called in crews from several other co-ops, other utilities, anybody that could come and help us get that, get that cleaned up. You know, and those, just those four, four weather events, that, the outage restoration cost for that was, was in excess of $2.5 million. Uh, that's a huge number. You know, it's, it, I've been all bad news and one really good joke. But we, there is one nugget of, one nugget of good news in there. Uh, in March of this year, we were awarded a, a $1.3 million grant from the state of Minnesota's Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management related to the July wind events. We had submitted about $1.7 million. They awarded us $1.3. It uh, wasn't, wasn't on the scale where FEMA would get involved, but the state jumped in and said, we'll help you out. So... We got that money in March. We were able to get that reflected back into the 2012 financial statements where those expenses were. So it, it made 2012 from a financial standpoint look a lot better than it actually was. However, we'll take it. It's free money. <laughs> what it comes down to for us is that we invest in and maintain equipment you know, to minimize extended outages and to make sure that the service is safe when you flip the switch. There are times when the weather dictates otherwise, and, and thankfully we do have crews that know how to take care of that. Uh, and I want to take, we got a video coming up right now, and it'll take, it'll take a look back at, you know, some of the flooding stuff around Big Sandy Lake north of McGregor, as well as, I mean, one guy out of Grand Rapids is in here. You'll see him in the snow, but he'll talk about some of the effort that was put forth by our employees, as well as employees of several other companies to get the lights turned back on in this, that July event. Thank you. <laughs> 